Welcome to the Investing Insights Podcast from Morningstar.com. In this week's podcast, we continue to cover movements in the market and how you should invest amid times of volatility. First, Daniel Needham discusses the importance of staying invested. Then, Karen Anderson and Preston Caldwell discuss the implications of the coronavirus for the economy and the market. Next, we highlight sectors that are the most undervalued. Then, Russ Kennel highlights funds that saw improvement in ratings after leadership changes. And lastly, Christine Ben shares the exceptions to the rule of sitting still during market volatility. So let's get started. First, Daniel Needham discusses the importance of staying invested during panic. Market volatility is one of the most reliable things that you can predict. You don't know what prices are going to do next month, next year. The one thing we know is that prices are going to move around. And what we see is that prices often move around more than fundamentals, more than the underlying cash flows. And that means at times you have these volatile periods where market prices will fall a lot, where stocks, share prices will fall, uh, and maybe even residential property prices will fall. And often people get scared. People feel the pain of losses more than they enjoy the pleasure of gains. One of the most important things is that you don't overreact and sell stocks when they're down or sell shares when they're down. That's the worst thing that people can do. We think that what you want to be able to do is be prepared for the periods of market volatility by buying assets that you think are worth more than the price that you're paying for them. At times, that means being willing to hold more cash. We view market volatility as an investment opportunity. Warren Buffett always says that he likes his stocks the way he likes his socks on sale. So often market volatility means lower prices. It's a funny thing that in the, in, in the stock market or the share market, people actually want more of something when the price goes up and they want less of something when the price goes down. We think that's exactly the opposite of how you should think about it. So generally when prices fall, it means you're able to buy stocks or shares, fractional ownerships of companies at better prices. We view it as a positive, not a negative. And so we prepare for the volatility by demanding good prices before we invest, and that allows us to have capital or cash available to take advantage of the market opportunity. So it's really important during periods of market volatility that you don't overreact, that you don't sell out your investment at the bottom. That's the worst thing that people can do. Our research shows that those that sell out at the bottom and then buy back in, say, a year later when they feel more comfortable do much worse than those that stay invested. So we think the most important thing is to actually not do anything and to talk to your financial advisor or your financial planner and really stick to the plan. That's what the plan's there for. In the short term, market's gonna move around a lot and it's very important that you take a long-term approach to investing. Our view is that when we have periods of market volatility or where prices fall, it's often a time where you should be adding more to your investments rather than taking them away. Any advice in this video is general advice prepared by Morningstar without reference to your objectives, financial situation, or needs. You should consider the advice in light of these matters and any relevant product disclosure statement before making any decision to invest. Six days a week, we deliver the latest news for investors. Just say, Alexa, enable the Morningstar skill, or visit Morningstar.com Alexa. Next, Karen Anderson and Preston Caldwell discuss the implications of the coronavirus for the economy and the market. Hi, I'm Christine Benz from Morningstar. News about the spread of the coronavirus is changing quickly and with it the implications for the economy and the market. Joining me to share some perspectives on these issues are Karen Anderson, she's a healthcare strategist for Morningstar, and Preston Caldwell, he's an equity analyst for Morningstar who covers the energy sector. Karen, let's start with you. You've been keeping tabs on the spread of the virus and whether these social distancing efforts have been working. Can you give us an update? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Christine. So, so yes, we're here one week after publishing our initial coronavirus analysis, uh, four days after our town hall where we talked about the report and health and economic implications. Uh, and I have to say, I do at this point, you know, this is a crazy situation. I understand the panic, you know, as a, as a country, as a planet, we have taken several aggressive steps to control the spread of the coronavirus um, just in the past few days. And it's probably fair to say that this is uncharted territory for, for pretty much all of us. And Chicago is really a great example. So uh, last Thursday, I talked about how important the social distancing steps were. I mentioned uh, conferences being canceled, large gatherings, uh, the potential for working from home, 
Uh, but since that time, many of us who can work from home are now doing so. And Chicago has opted to close schools for March, as well as uh, starting today, uh, the end of day, uh, bars and dine-in restaurant service. So uh, countries like France, Spain are taking similar actions um, as coronavirus cases in the US and Europe are rising. Also, we've seen some private businesses like Apple are closing their doors. Uh, but I guess I'd say overall, this is this is exactly what we need to do. And the fact that this is happening at a rapid pace is encouraging. Okay, so let's talk about other mitigation efforts. You keep tabs on the healthcare sector. I think we've all been watching that space eagerly, hoping there will be some breakthroughs. Um, any news on that front in terms of drug development, vaccines, uh, uh, testing, and so forth? Yeah, sure. So. We did write a note and quick update on Friday with uh, a little bit of information that we've got on uh, Gilead's leading drug uh, to treat coronavirus called remdesivir. Um, we are still waiting for the key phase three data readout. That's going to be coming either later this month or in April. Uh, that hasn't changed. But the Wall Street Journal, Journal did report on the status of 14 Americans from the Diamond Princess cruise line uh, who were treated in Japan. Um, and these were critically ill patients with an average age around 75, who uh, appear to be doing well uh, two weeks after initiating this 10-day treatment regimen. Uh, more than half of them have recovered, and there have been no deaths, which, uh, for reference, you know, uh, the data we have uh, that was published in uh, the Journal of the American Medical Association from the largest data set we have in China shows a death rate of about 49% for those who become critically ill. So, so the fact that these patients are doing fairly well who had become so sick. Uh, I think that is um, positive news for the potential efficacy of Gilead's drug. Also, uh, Sanofi and Regeneron have announced that they, uh, they've they kind of detailed the study that they'll be performing for their arthritis drug, Kevzara, uh, as a coronavirus treatment. Um, so, so I guess I'd say overall, you know, it's uh, with the mitigation efforts, we're, we're rapidly changing our behavior. Um, we are seeing steady improvements in diagnostic testing and the number of potential treatments that are likely to benefit patients in the long run. But, you know, these these efforts are just beginning and there's a little bit of a lag here. Um, you know, we're, we're probably going to see, I'd say over the next week or two, an increase in diagnosis as we get more people tested. Uh, we're going to see a lag in, you know, the time for people who maybe were infected, were exposed before these social mitigation efforts went into place. So I guess I would just prepare people over the next week or two. This is probably going to get worse before it gets better. Okay. Preston, let's turn to you. You and Karen released a report last week where you indicated that the long-term economic impact you thought at the time would be modest. Is that still your view? Our view is, is still that in the long run, the economic impact from all of this will be modest. And, and given that, um, even with the um, further slide in equities that we've seen, um, we, we still think these equity markets are, are overreacting. We don't think they're responding to a real long-run threat. Um, you know, of course, still in the short run, we emphasize there could be a significant impact. And in fact, based on a, a tweaking of our, our probabilities, um, um, based on an emerging assessment of the virus, uh, we have slightly adjusted our economic impact numbers. So we thought originally there would be a 1.5% uh, hit to 2020 GDP, and now we've bumped that up to 2%. But of course, these probabilities are, you know, fluctuating almost on a daily basis. So um, so take that with a grain of salt. But the, the key number is that still our long-term impact is, is minimal um, at uh, currently at 0.3%. Um, and uh, given that, we, we don't think that the fall in equities that we've seen so far is, is warranted. Um, you know, there, on the economic side, there there really hasn't been much uh, in in terms of new developments um, outside of what we've conceived. Again, as Karen mentioned, the the mitigation efforts that we've seen, obviously, they will have some short term economic impact. But insofar as they um, help contain the virus, that's really a positive in terms of long run economic impact. What we really want to avoid is you know, avoid is uh, closing factories and logistics supply chains to the greatest extent possible. So, you know, if we can keep as much of the, the core of the economy running, even while uh, we we have a, a you know targeted focus on closing, uh, you know, schools, large events, et cetera, um, that's really a, a best case scenario for the economy, um, especially in the short run. 
Um, so, um, again, given all that, our, our overall view remains in place, uh, minimal long run impact. And um, we think it's a, um, uh, an overreaction that we've seen in equity markets. So you cover the energy sector for us. Can you briefly touch on uh, what's been going on there in terms of, of oil prices and so forth? Well, um, so it, really not much has changed since uh, Thursday when I talked. And, and um, you know, the big events were, were earlier in the week when, when OPEC Plus um, met and failed to come to a, a production agreement. And so, again, the story there generally remains the same. OPEC Plus, which is OPEC in addition to Russia, um, is not going to be cutting production. And as a result of the abrogated agreement, they're going to be increasing their production substantially, likely uh, through the end of this year. Um, and that's going to cause oil markets to go into oversupply and, and has caused this collapse in oil prices that we've seen. And this is something we think will work itself out, um, perhaps sooner, perhaps later. But Eventually, we will have to see a, a rebound in oil prices because uh, the marginal supplier of oil globally is U.S. shale, um, which has a break-even cost of $55 per barrel, in our view. Um, and therefore, if, if we don't see a return to that oil price, then we'll see collapse in U.S. shale production, which will build year after year and eventually compel a um, rebalancing of global oil supply and demand. So. Um, very troubled in the near run, and we eventually expect a, um, a return to higher prices. Um, but the the duration of the low prices is going to be long enough to really hit energy equities hard. So we, we've definitely um, continued to update our views there. We brought many of our energy equity fair values down uh, over the last week. Okay, thank you, Preston and Karen, for taking time to share your perspective. We'll be checking back with you regularly as uh, new developments unfold. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for watching. I'm Christine Benz for Morningstar. Watch all the Morningstar content you love from your living room. Download the Morningstar Roku channel and get up-to-date independent insights on today's markets. Be comfortable. Be informed. Now, we highlight the sectors that are most undervalued. Given the market turmoil we've experienced during the past few weeks, it's time to check in on the Morningstar market fair value. This metric shows how big of a gap, on average, we see between market prices and our estimate of intrinsic value across the entire market or a specific sector. The current ratio for all rated stocks is 0.74. This indicates that the market is about 26% undervalued today. The market hasn't been this undervalued by our metrics since 2011. No sector is overvalued today. With a ratio of 0.85, the consumer defensive and utility sectors are the closest to fairly valued. In particular, utilities have been overvalued for a long time as investors have sought out these stocks for their high yields. This pullback in prices offers a buying opportunity for investors. The most undervalued sector is energy at 0.44. That's 56% below our estimate of intrinsic value. Some of our top picks in the energy sector include Diamondback Energy, Enbridge, and Synovus Energy. Next, Russ Kennel puts a spotlight on the funds that saw improvement in ratings after leadership changes. Hi, I'm Christine Benz from Morningstar. Investors often assume that a manager change is automatically a red flag, but that's not always the case. Joining me to discuss some funds that have actually seen upgrades to their analyst ratings since experiencing manager changes is Russ Kinnell. He's Morningstar's Director of Manager Research. Russ, thank you so much for being here. Glad to be here. In your latest issue of Morningstar Fund Investor, you wrote about some manager changes, some for the better, some for the worse. We're going to focus on the ones that were actually improvements at various funds. Let's start with a biggie, or certainly a fund that was a biggie when you and I were manager <laughs> research analysts, Fidelity Magellan. Um, it experienced a manager change, and we've subsequently uh, upgraded the fund. That's right. We raised the fund from to, to bronze with Sammy Simnagar taking over the fund. Uh, this is the first time Magellan's ever been rated bronze. Uh, the, the thing we like here is Sammy Simnagar has, has a good record at uh, emerging markets and an international uh, fund, and we think he'll be able to largely apply that 
approach to uh, Magellan. So in, in our view, it's, it, it's good enough. Uh, obviously, Magellan's history post Peter Lynch or maybe post Jeff Vinnick is right. pretty lousy. It's been pretty uh, disappointing, uh, sometimes dramatically so, sometimes just sort of gradually underperforming. Uh, but really, you have to kind of take a reset view on, on it and, and recognize uh, what if it wasn't named Magellan? This is a, a successful manager with, with a good strategy. Now it's down to about $19 billion in assets. So whereas uh, assets used to be a huge handicap for a right. single manager to run, now it's not that big a deal for running a large growth uh, strategy. Uh, Simon guy has got kind of an unusual strategy where he has a bunch of modest overweights versus a benchmark, uh, but somehow that you know that's that's worked well for him, and so you know we think that can work here. Okay, so when you say Russ that it's it's first time at a bronze rating, it had not been a medalist before, correct? That's right. So we've been doing medal ratings since 2011, and it, it's been stuck on neutral and not okay. really tempting to to move it uh, up since then. So. Uh, and really, if you like I said, really you have to go back to the 90s when it, to, to find a time when it actually had some appeal. Okay. So let's look at another one. This is Alger Small Cap Focus, um, Amy Zhang uh, running the fund here. And let's talk about why you and the team saw her arrival at this fund as sort of immediately good news for shareholders. Yeah. Uh, she came over from uh, Brown Capital Small uh, Company Management. Uh, and that fund has been very highly rated for us. It's currently gold, uh, a great record of a small cap growth strategy based out of Baltimore. Um, they've just done a, a really good job, and she was part of that team. Uh, so when she came over to Alger, uh, about a year after she, she came over, we put a bronze rating on it. Uh, and now, more recently, we've raised it to silver. Uh, so uh, a really good, uh, fairly aggressive growth strategy, but one that keeps in mind you know, earnings, uh, sustainability of, of those earnings. Uh, and so uh, we've really uh, warmed up on, on the fund. Okay. So this one is definitely not for Sunday drivers. This is a very aggressive portfolio, correct? That's right. It's, it's an aggressive fund. And, you know, when, when she took over, uh, we, we expected uh, she would run the strategy like Brown had been run. But our question was really, like, uh, she was a, a team member, so we don't right. know exactly how good she would be, how good would execution be, because you never know with a team exactly how much credit any individual manager should get. And over time, she clearly proved uh, to be a very good manager. Uh, so uh, that's what got it to silver. Uh, and you know, in this case, clearly uh, an upgrade when they brought her in. Okay. So another fund that uh, saw a, an, an upgrade um, and had a manager change is Artisan International Small Mid Cap. Let's talk about that one, a manager coming over from Oppenheimer Funds. Yeah, this is, uh, you talked about aggressive. This fund's even more aggressive under Rezo Kanovich. Uh, he came over from Oppenheimer. Uh, we're at a very uh, strong track record. Uh, Artisan brought him in. Uh, the name was changed from small cap to small mid, so obviously uh, move up a market cap a bit, but also moving well out uh, on our growth style box. So very aggressive growth strategy. Um, so uh, tremendous return potential, but we rated bronze uh, not higher in part because when you risk adjust, it's not quite as attractive. This is clearly a pretty aggressive strategy, but one that he's done very well uh, at Oppenheimer and so far has, has done well at Artisan. Okay. So kind of a broader question for you, Russ, for investors who are navigating manager changes if they have actively managed mutual funds. Even if a manager has a good track record somewhere else, how do you and the team get confidence that um, they'll do a good job at the new fund? Because, you know, as you say, you have questions maybe about the team supporting them, about the resources they have. How should investors try to get their arms around those questions? Yeah, it's, it's a, there's a lot of layers to that, but certainly one question is how much help did they have? How much uh, were they, uh, could they take ownership of that past record? And what's their new situation? Uh, you know, for instance, uh, in the case of Kanovich, Oppenheimer is very, tends to have very small teams. And so the fact that he was on a new small team and it even brought over an analyst he worked with at, at Oppenheimer, uh, you know, gave us confidence. So it wasn't like he had was part of a huge team. Right. And, and, and uh, so I think you want to look at that. You want to look, is the strategy different? You want to look at asset sizes. In, the, in some of the cases we mentioned, the managers were actually going to a smaller fund. So that's a positive, especially with a smaller mid-cap strategy where asset size can be a liability. Okay, Russ. Always great to get your insights. Thank you so much for being here. You're welcome. 
Thanks for watching. I'm Christine Benz for Morningstar. Expand your investing horizons and look to the long term with Morningstar's new podcast, The Long View. Join hosts Christine Benz and Jeff Patak as they talk to influential leaders in investing, advice, and personal finance. Search for and subscribe to The Long View today. And lastly this week, Christine Benz shares the exceptions to the rule of sitting still during market volatility. Hi, I'm Susan Jabinski for Morningstar.com. Amid ongoing market volatility, investors have probably heard they shouldn't do anything, just hang tight. But is that always the right advice? Joining me to discuss some situations when doing something might actually make sense is Christine Benz. She's Director of Personal Finance at Morningstar. Christine, thanks for joining me today. Susan, it's great to be here. Um, now the market's fallen yes. quite a bit recently, and, um, and it's conventional wisdom in these times. We always hear, just hang tight, don't make any changes. And wh why is that what we hear all the time? <laughs> well, because it's generally good advice if you've taken the time to create an asset allocation plan that makes sense for you given your life stage. You don't want to be monkeying with it in the midst of market volatility. Chances are you will make some changes that you'll later regret. And then another key concept that we keep talking about and writing about is the distinction between volatility and risk. So for younger investors, yes, volatility is there. We see these ups and downs in the market. Risk is actually messing around with your plan, maybe making it more conservative at an inopportune time, and running the risk of falling short in retirement. So it's really important to understand the difference, understand that as a young investor with many years until retirement, the volatility is your friend, actually. Mm -hmm. It doesn't feel like it, but it truly is your opportunity to sit tight with a stock-heavy portfolio, potentially even add more to that portfolio. We're in the midst of IRA contribution season and what a great time to make new IRA contributions. Mm -hmm. Volatility is your friend for a young investor, even though it doesn't feel like it. So let's talk about some of the exceptions to the rules, because there always are some in life. Um, you've said in, in things that you've written and said before that often people should, should actually think about using volatility as a wake-up call to re-examine their portfolios. And um, one group um, that you suggest perhaps do that is young people. What would young people be looking for in their portfolios to possibly do in a volatile market? Well, the key thing is um, young investors can and should be saving for retirement. That's sort of one bucket of money. But also think about other goals that you might have. And my sense is that some young investors have been dabbling in stocks, individual stocks in particular, with maybe short and intermediate mm. term time horizons. They'd gotten lucky prior to this recent volatility yeah. where some of these things had just been rocket ships. But I think it's a wake up call if they do have nearer term uh, goals that they're saving for, they need to de-risk those funds. So if, if it's money that you expect to spend in fewer than 10 years, certainly in the next two to five years, de-risk that money, get it into low yielding, but safer investments. Now, what about investors who are a little older and approaching retirement? You know, again, it's during a volatile market, what should they be thinking about with their portfolios? Right, and the market has adjusted all of our equity exposures mm -hmm. downward, but I do think that people at this life stage should take a look at their total portfolio's asset allocation or get the advice of a financial advisor to help them check up on what they've got. The long-running equity market rally, I think, tended to make us all a little un inert about making <laughs> changes. It was easy sure. to be comfy when everything was going up. We've had a little bit of volatility. So I do think that um, if retirement is within the next five to 10 years for you, think about de-risking your portfolio if you haven't taken any steps to do so in recent years. You can use a target date fund to help guide what might be an appropriate asset allocation given your life stage or really the gold standard for getting a professional read on your asset allocation would be checking in with an advisor. Now, what about investors who um, 
maybe don't have very aggressive portfolios. Maybe they're a little bit more conservative already. What should they be thinking about right now? This is a surprisingly common portfolio. Yeah. You would think who would be still conservatively positioned, but a lot of investors at various points along the way over the past decade have gotten themselves conservative for one mm -hmm. reason or another. In some cases, it owes to someone having an infusion of cash into their plan, maybe an inheritance, maybe they sold a business. It never quite felt like a good time mm -hmm. to get that chunk of cash invested. I'm not saying it's the perfect time <laughs> to get that cash invested, but investors like that should use the recent volatility as at least an impetus to see, well, how about on a dollar cost averaging plan, if I move this money into the market, how many months would it take? Set up a program for getting those funds invested so that you are in an asset allocation mix that makes sense for you. Because even though having cash and safe investments feels good now as everything's been going down, I think you'll be feeling it if things head back up and they eventually likely will. Right. Christine, thank you so much for your time today. This is great advice. Thank you, Susan. I'm Susan Jabinski for Morningstar.com. Thanks for tuning in. That does it for this week's Investing Insights podcast from Morningstar.com. We hope you've enjoyed our program and we welcome your feedback. Please send your comments and questions to podcast at Morningstar.com. From everyone here at Morningstar, thanks for listening.